Today we look at what we affectionately call Palm Sunday, or in Hebrew it's Shabbat Hagadol, um, also called the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, just four days prior to his crucifixion. But today I want to focus um, on the donkey, the donkey that Jesus rode. And don't worry, it will be about Jesus as well, but uh, I want to put, as it were, the magnifying glass on the donkey. And perhaps it's the first time you hear a Palm Sunday sermon about uh, the donkey. But it's a detail that's in there for a purpose, and uh, as we will see. Um, the triumphal en triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, what we now call Palm Sunday, um, is recorded in all four Gospels. But on top of that, it has been prophesied um, yeah, to the T, I would say, by the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah 9, in verse 9. And I want to read that first. It says there, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a donkey, and upon a colt, the fall of a donkey. Um, I've said uh, often, uh, take notice of the verbs, because the verbs tell you what to do. And uh, Zechariah writes here uh, three verbs in this, uh, in the beginning of this verse: rejoice, shout, and behold. And that shows something great, something very important is happening. Pay attention. And nevertheless, when it finally happened hundreds of years later, very few understood it. Certainly not the scribes and the Pharisees. And they were only worried. Uh, about all the upheaval that it would uh, draw the attention of the Romans and bring their uh, position uh, in, in, uh, in jeopardy and get them into trouble. So, yeah, I said we find it in all four Gospels. Uh, let's read the, the version from Matthew, Matthew 21, the first to seven verses. It says there, And when they drew night unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphag, Unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find a donkey tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say unto you, You shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. And all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon a donkey, and the colt, the foal of a donkey. And the disciples went, and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the donkey and the colt, and put, them on, uh, put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. So, Matthew is the only, four, uh, for, uh, only one from the four Gospels that mentions that both the mother uh, and the cult were uh, taken. But all four Gospels agree that Jesus rode on the colt, on a young donkey, that never had been ridden before. Now, it makes uh, sense actually that uh, the mother donkey was also taken, because otherwise the, the colt would um, have felt very uncomfortable and maybe unwilling to come uh, to come with uh, or go with the disciples um, and being taken away from her, uh, from his, I would say, mother. Um, and all four Gospels also agree that this was actually the fulfillment of um, Zechariah's prophecy. And Matthew quotes it here uh, almost verbatim. So, why was it important that the donkey was chosen as a means of transport? Why did God put in this detail and also emphasizes it sort of? That's the question and um, let's look at, uh, at the why indeed. Now, in order to understand 
and to be able to answer this question we have to change maybe our view of uh, of the donkey first of all the word because uh, those uh, of you that uh, read along um, in the king james bible might have noticed that uh, i changed the word and that's the word donkey actually um, it's a word that uh, is uh, recently new it has been used only since about 1785 before that time, um, the, the word donkey didn't exist, it was, the animal was called an ass. And that is also the word that we find throughout the King James um, uh, Version. However, uh, that um, word uh, in, um, in slang has uh, become a word to refer to the rear end of someone, and uh, has a bit negative connotation, and so therefore uh, to avoid this um, this uh, association, uh, I changed the word uh, in, uh, in the text that I read today. <clears throat> and um, actually the same uh, also uh, applies to the word jackass, which is um, uh, the male donkey. And uh, we, maybe some of you know this word also from uh, um, um, a TV series, uh, or, yeah, if you can call it that, that uh, ran... Uh, few decades ago um, not worth watching by the way but um, so we have the word donkey which refers to uh, the color of the fur of uh, the animal which is a, a dun color and dun color dun co became donkey um, so that's uh, the thing but because of this sort of negative annotation of the old word for donkey most likely there is came into existence this this idea that it's a dumb animal um, that it's stupid and that it's stubborn but actually nothing is further from the truth um, once that the the owner of a donkey gains the trust of the animal uh, they are very willing and they are very loyal and um, there is this condition. They will actually not work their best until they um, they trust the one that they are working for. And once they are okay with their owner, they will do everything they can. And the advantage is they hardly need any training. They are sure-footed. That means they uh, they can navigate very well in in um, rocky terrain. Um, they they don't easily stumble and there is this saying that um, a donkey uh, never um, never hits the same stone again and so uh, in other words it, it remembers the obstacles uh, that it has found on its path and uh, the next time around it will avoid those obstacles um, in addition they have very good eyesight very good uh, hearing and um, very good smell Many cases, in many cases, they actually lead the way and they don't need to be guided. So in that they are quite different from a horse, for example. And they are very good in detecting predators because of the hearing, smell and eyesight, uh, of course. And so some farmers um, place a donkey in between, their, uh, in between their herd for that purpose. Because once a predator approaches, the donkey will sense it and will begin uh, to, uh, to bay uh, very loudly. If you have heard uh, a donkey bay, then you know how, uh, how much noise it makes. But not only that, um, if the predator um, continues to approach, the donkey places itself in between the predator and the, uh, the other animals in order to protect them. And they can uh, kill foxes, coyotes, mountain lions with, their, uh, with a powerful kick of their sharp hooves. And yeah, as I said, they have this uh, reputation of being stubborn, but they are not really stubborn. However, if they sense danger, they will not do anything to challenge that danger. They just won't, won't go there. And so that's uh, what we know also from the story of Balaam. Uh, Balaam's donkey did not move when he sensed the angel with a sword on the, on the path before them. Um, 
But Balaam, who was spiritually blind, tried to force the donkey to move, even by hitting it, but to no prevail. We know the story from the book of Numbers. And there we see also a, um, a, a beautiful type, especially in that story, because Balaam was supposed to be uh, the prophet, the man of God, uh, but he appeared to be um, non uh, nothing of that at all and um, was spiritually blind, as I said. But uh, one that has spiritual discernment, and that is what the donkey was representing, uh, among other things, um, will um, will stubborn be stubbornly against uh, anything that, that is spiritually dangerous. So uh, that's, that's one of the lessons we can learn uh, from that um, story and we we discussed that in the past now donkeys were domesticated around 3000 before christ that was long before the camel uh, was domesticated and the donkey is more efficient also than a camel um, or a horse it eats only a quarter of the amount of oats than a horse does and compared to a camel um, when it eats, the owner does not have to wait until it uh, chews its uh, its cud. Uh, for the camel, it uh, takes time, and uh, yeah, he, the owner can just wait until the camel is is done with all that, and uh, before he can move on. The uh, the donkey doesn't have this um, this disadvantage. And so around uh, 2500 before Christ, um, wealthy Egyptians would own more than a thousand donkeys. And uh, also later the Greeks and the Romans, they, um, they had donkeys, they used them. And even in, world, in the First World War, uh, donkeys were used to carry the wounded soldiers uh, out of the battlefield. And um, as recent as in the war uh, in Afghanistan, they, um, they were used to... Um, uh, to carry uh, packs uh, for the soldiers. And donkeys um, have been used throughout biblical times. And um, according to the Babylonian archives, uh, riding a donkey when entering a city was an act of kingship. So that is quite a different picture maybe of the donkey than what we in general have. Great men in the Bible, they all rode donkeys. Abram rode a donkey, Moses did too, uh, Jacob's sons rode donkeys, and if you read the book of Judges, you read there that the judges also rode donkeys, and also King David rode a donkey. Now tradition tells us, and mind you that's not in the Bible, <laughs> Uh, maybe to your surprise, but tradition tells us that Mary rode a donkey to Bethlehem when she was pregnant with Jesus. And we know this from numerous uh, pictures and movies and whatnot, but um, actually it's tradition, it's, it's not in the Bible. But uh, let's assume it's true, then um, we can say that Jesus' first and his last ride as a human being um, was on a donkey. So, what about this donkey? And it's, it's a peculiar animal and it is as if there are, if God has a special place for the donkey. And um, I think it, it is so, as there are special regulations for donkeys compared to other animals. Uh, for example, in Exodus 23, we read that um, on the Sabbath, the donkey should rest just like the ox. Now, both, both are beasts of burden, of course, um, but um, the donkey is, is separate in the sense that it's an unclean animal, which means it's not, um, it's not suitable for food. And we spoke about that uh, a while ago. So, um, what does it say in Exodus 23, verse 12? Six days shalt thou do thy work, and on the seventh day thou shalt rest that thine ox and thine donkey may rest, and the son of thy handmaid and the stranger may be refreshed. So the donkey is specifically mentioned here. 
And even in the Ten Commandments, the last commandment where it speaks about coveting uh, or not coveting actually the possessions of your neighbor, there uh, the donkey is again mentioned specifically. Uh, in Exodus 20 verse 17 we read, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Interesting, the donkey, but it gets more interesting because we find also uh, in Exodus um, the laws of consecrating the firstborn. Now of all the clean animals, the firstborn is always to be dedicated to the Lord. This applies to clean animals and also to crops, by the way, uh, as we know from the Feast of First Fruits. The only unclean animal that is mentioned in this is again the donkey and there is a special specific regulation that only applies to the donkey and we read this in Exodus 34 verses 19 and 20 it says there all that openeth the matrix is mine and every firstling among thy cattle whether ox or sheep that is male but the firstling of a donkey thou shalt redeem with a lamb and if thou redeem him not then shalt thou break his neck. All the firstborn of thy sons shalt uh, thou shalt redeem, and none shall appear before me empty. So what do we read here? That if an Israel, Israelite wanted to keep the firstborn donkey, male donkey, it had to be redeemed by sacrificing a lamb. Otherwise it was to be killed. Yeah, its neck had to be broken. And, and it says then also in this text that um, all the firstborn of thy sons shall, thou shalt redeem. So in that sense, uh, not the breaking of the neck by the way, but in the part of redeeming the firstborn applies to the, the, the male the, the children, the sons of the Israelites, and to the donkey. Only those, only this animal has the same um, regulation as uh, the... Um, the firstborn uh, sons. Um, and it had to be redeemed by sacrificing a lamb. Now think of this. If the colt that Jesus was riding was uh, a firstborn male, and I believe it is, as, as everything points to that, then a lamb had died for it in order for it to live, to be redeemed, to be bought free. And so the donkey that Jesus was riding was symbolizing exactly what Jesus would do for us as, as firstborn uh, sons, uh, Israelites, uh, spiritual Israelites that is. Jesus died for us, redeemed us, bought us free. The, the innocent, uh, unblemished lamb that di died for us so that we can live. If not... If we do not accept this gift of salvation, then we are dead. Now, the cult also that um, Jesus wrote was never written before. And so, in itself, it also symbolized this unblemished beast of burden, without blemish or spot, it had not been used, it was clean. And so we see all of this uh, already symbolized in this donkey. So Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem was very carefully planned by God for a specific purpose. And actually it did not make Jesus look poor, but it made him look like a king. And that is what we see, the people were were putting their coats on the, on the street and waving these palm branches. They were hailing him as a king. They were singing Hosanna, save us now. And um, none of them was thinking, why is he uh, miserably poor on a donkey? No, uh, not at all. On the contrary, they saw him as a king. And this was, this was known, eh, as I said before, from the Babylonian uh, archives entering a city on a donkey. This is what the king did. It was a sign to them. And um, 
In fact, uh, interesting detail is that according to the Talmud, uh, which I don't endorse, but according to the Talmud, the Jews still expect today, uh, they expect the Messiah to, uh, to come on a donkey. So it just shows um, how deep this, uh, this tradition goes. So it, it maybe changes our uh, interpretation of the word lowly in uh, Zechariah 9 verse 9. It is meek, yes, but in the sense of gentle and peaceful, not poor. The symbolic character of the donkey is, uh, is that it is an animal for peaceful things. Donkey is always used for peaceful things, which contrasts a horse, which is associated with war. A man who rides a donkey is not uh, looking for war. Jesus came to save. And notice again that this cult uh, was never ridden before. And remember that I said that a donkey will not work uh, unless it gains uh, the trust of uh, it, unless it trusts its owner. And so we see that in this case, this cult um, com uh, complied uh, immediately. And uh, we see how uh, God was directing it, and, um, as we have seen so many times in the, in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, by the way. But in the New Testament, how Jesus um, commands with his voice nature, and whether it be animals or um, the elements. And we see it here too. And so we can also assume that this uh, donkey did not need guidance. It knew what to do and it... Uh, it slowly rode Jesus through the city gate. So the prophecy of Zechariah 9 verse 9 uh, regards the first coming of Jesus and that has been fulfilled. It's clear, it is recorded in, um, in all the Gospels, uh, we know uh, this is so. But now let's see how this relates to his second coming. And of course, we read about that, the fulfillment of that in Revelation 19. And I want to read verse 11 through 13, where it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And in verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he threaded the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. But the very first thing mentioned here when, uh, when heaven opens, is a white horse, not a donkey. So I said, as the donkey is an animal for peaceful purposes, so the horse is associated with war. And that's exactly what we read in this text. He comes to judge and make war. So we see there is a big difference in the purpose of the first and the second coming. And um, it is reflected in the animals that Jesus rides. So back to today's celebration, Palm Sunday. While Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey through the eastern gate, another lamb entered the city through the sheep gate. And that was the so-called lamb for the nation. So on Passover, on that day, four uh, days prior to, uh, to Passover, eh, on the 10th of Nisan, uh, every family would bring a lamb, a lamb for the uh, redemption of the sins of that family, and it, they would bring it to Jerusalem to be sacrificed. And so literally thousands, uh, tens of thousands of lambs were sacrificed uh, there. And... Um, but there was one lamb that, that covered the whole nation and that was brought in through this sheep gate and the priest would uh, then later uh, sacrifice that on Passover day. Um, 
which basically happened at the moment that Jesus was uh, crucified. But um, so, as we see Jesus entering uh, Jerusalem through the eastern gate, uh, this lamb of the nation was enter entering through the sheep gate. This this setting aside of um, of the the lamb on Palm Sunday, and which of course stems from uh, what we read in, in Exodus twelve, where God commanded um, the people, the Israelites, through Moses, to to select an unblemished lamb and take it in their house and inspect it for four days. Uh, in order to have it sacrificed on the 14th, Nissan 14th. This, this setting aside of this, uh, this uh, lamb uh, on Nissan 10, also called Shabbat Hagadol, the great Shabbat, uh, this is also called a sanctification of the lamb. And it's interesting that on that day that Jesus entered uh, Jerusalem on the donkey, uh, in the evening of that day, uh, Mary anointed Jesus' feet with precious oil. Uh, this we can read in uh, John 12. And so we see that also uh, the lamb who died for our sins was, uh, was sanctified on that day. Uh, it's a special day where we remember that our Lord has been set aside for the great work, namely his sacrifice to set us free and to redeem us. And so, again, let's look at this donkey. We, we are like the donkey. And I, I mentioned this uh, way back when we talked about uh, Balaam, the story. I also made this comparison that, that we, the believers, are like the donkey. And we see it here also. Uh, uh, the donkey is an unclean animal, as we are unclean uh, because of our sins. And uh, like the donkey, we can only live if a lamb, not a lamb, but the lamb, uh, Jesus, um, dies for us, uh, which he did. We need only to accept this, uh, this gift of salvation. Only then we can live. Now, if we look at the donkey... There are some characteristics that um, we find in the donkey that should also be found in us. And this is where we can learn something and, and uh, maybe um, reflect on. I already mentioned, of course, before the, um, the discernment. Eh? The hearing, sight and smell of the donkey are, are uh, outstanding. Um, so it discerns when a predator comes. And this is something that we should also have this discernment. If truly the Spirit lives in us, then we have spiritual discernment. And we should also be able to, um, to discern when, uh, when a predator um, is after us. And I'm speaking spiritually, obviously. But there are other questions we can ask ourselves. Uh, do we trust our Master and work willingly for Him? Another question is, do we exhibit meekness, gentleness and peace? The donkey is an animal that is used only for peaceful purposes. Are we like that? Are we sure-footed? And do we know the path of our destination? Do, do we avoid the obstacles uh, that we know that are on our path? And lastly, do we guard and protect the sheep of God's pasture, like the donkey even puts himself in between the predator and the sheep? Do we have that posture? It's an interesting animal with um, interesting characteristics from which we can learn a lot. And none of this is by chance. It is again showing this the, how God orchestrates everything in history and in his entire creation. Now we better fully accept the sacrifice of Jesus and then also display the characteristics of this lowly donkey. Only then we will be qualified to ride with him when he comes uh, the second time on a white horse. Um, and we 
uh, we will follow him on white horses dressed in white robes, the robes of righteousness. And so that is what it's all about. Um, it's a sort of introduction uh, to Passover. And so this is what we mainly think of, of course. And the donkey plays an important role in it because it shows our, our position where we are. But if we live up to this, if we accept his gift and we, we live up to it, we live it also, then um, we will also be um, uh, qualified to ride with him when he comes on a white horse. And we read about this, and I want to end with that, in Revelation 19 verse 14, that was the verse I skipped before. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Amen.